Okay. 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 Welcome back. Can you see the screen again? No. I Not yet. Share. Not no, yet. I, I forgot to share. <laughs> Now you should. Now, now it's okay. Okay. So again, uh, a lot of information coming from the ground station, from the river gold station, but which is very local and can be assimilated only locally. So to improve the estimates of the floodplain on the actual flooded area, we can use uh, at least a one uh, in this case, Landsat imagery, okay? Landsat imagery has the characteristic of providing water detection at quite high spatial resolution, about 30 meters spatial resolution. Here, of course, we don't have a ground truth to verify this, okay? Because the only information we have about the flood extent is the one that, that we see from satellite. But one advant advantage, as you know, of the Kalman filter is reducing the, the uncertainty. Okay, so here you have from a number of ensembles of model perturbed prediction of the flood wave, you have the range, okay, in the classical box plot of the area or in that area and how this reduce and also increase as an average by assimilating the uh, Landsat imagery. There is a problem of Landsat, of the assimilation of the Landsat imagery. It's the only one in time, Okay, and as I mentioned in introduction, this is a typical convergence system. Okay, here you have in this uh, pink color the spread uh, or the uncertainty in the estimation of uh, the water at different locations. Okay, the ground truth and the open loop estimation. Then you have the estimation of the flood way of the flood extent from the satellite. You, you had a sudden improvement in estimation and a reducing of the uncertainty, of the uncertainty, but only after after only a few hours, you see the system go back uh, to the initial uncertainty in run state because of little persistency in time of the update. So of course the strategy, the better strategy, uh, as in the, I will show the final result in this this final slot is to assimilate both, okay? So to use the point observation to as a continuous monitoring system, okay? That compensate the little persistency of the updates, okay? And the Landsat imagery to compensate for the sparsity of the ground observation. So here you have, for example, always in terms of the uncertainty in the spatial extent of the flood, in blue, the open loop. In green, if you assimilate the Landsat, the satellite observation only, so it will go back uh, in a short time to the original open loop uncertainty. And the improvement that you get assimilating the ground, the ground uh, river stage observation, only one little improvement, a lot of improvement assimilating all the information from the ground stations, and of course, the total improvement that you get assimilating both. Okay, let me quick, okay, move to the other part of typical, I would say, family of that assimilations problem, which is called geophysical inversion, where again, the main goal of the assimilation is not only to improve the state estimation, but to resolve uncertainties in the model parameters, okay? Here, the problem that I will face is a problem of actual identification of a, a, and quantification of what are the causes of last subsidence that by hypothesis may be induced by excessive groundwater abstraction. So it's a really what we may call a true backward reasoning, okay? It is really, finding the clue uh, to go back to the cause of the given problem that you don't know by uh, you're, you, that you may not even sure for that being the cause. So it's really here, I will not spend too much time, waste too much time on this. It's really 
a backward reasoning in, in the investigation uh, sense. Here you can read the quote from a novel from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, whose main character, you know, it was Sherlock Holmes. That probably was the first piece of literature with the concept of backward reasoning of, of inverse problem was introduced. Finding the cause of the guilt of a crime from the clue that you can get on the ground after the crime has, occur has occurred. So the problem here, uh, the study area is an aquifer, again, in central Italy, an area where it, there is a strong water abstraction to irrigate plant nursery, with a very important economic activity. There has been a lot of uh, clues about land subsidence, mainly damages to buildings and so forth. And of course, we have even in this case, satellite measurements that can de detect this kind of uh, problems. Here you we, we have been using in the study, okay, interferometric estimates of surface deformation from two different satellites that cover different time periods, Envisat from 2003 to 2010, and Sentinel-1 from 2015-2017. These are the velocity <coughs> of surface displacement inferred by these two satellites in these two periods. The line of sight, uh, the, usually the satellites have a slanted field of view with respect to the ground, and which may be, uh, I would say, quantitative interesting is the vertical displacement. Okay, here you have a legend, and in red and um, yellow, you have the areas where you actually subsidence is measured, that is, negative velocity in the displacement of the order of several millimeters per year. How do we address the hypothesis uh, that this subsidence may be due to excessive groundwater extraction, okay? We set up a couple surface hydrology groundwater model fed by various forcing data, precipitation, temperature, everything that may influence the groundwater dynamics. Okay, and as states predicted by this model are both the groundwater budget, but also the aquifer deformation. Aquifer is a, a elastic and unelastic for certain extent media that react to the changes in water content. Okay, and then we use the satellite surface deformation I showed you before, and also some West data uh, to infer the model parameters that are unknown. Uh, these are mainly uh, hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer and the elastic and inelastic, inelastic skeletal storage coefficient. That are the ones that will control how much deformation you can get at the ground uh, for changing water content. This is especially because of the sparsity of wells data and underdetermined inverse problem. Okay. So the technique that we use to solve this inverse problem is a variational data simulation. The problem is nonlinear. Uh, we tick on off regular, regularization. Now, I think it may be a good idea uh, to give you also some more technical information on some of these, uh, I would say, technical terms. Tick on, tick on off regularization is quite a general concept that is used in solving inverse underdetermined problems, okay? Underdetermined problems by taking a long story simple is where you have too little information with respect to the unknowns that you want to estimate with the inversion um, of the problem. So formally, assume that you have, I will start with the linear, simple linear part, that you have a simple linear inverse problem that is finding the parameter theta so, so that a linear problem G, a matrix G of the state X multiplied by the state parameter theta give you some measurement Z, okay? And as you know, if the amount of measurement in Z you have are too little with respect to the model parameter theta, the problem is ill-conditioned, okay? So you want to solve this problem anyway. Okay, a technique uh, is to add to the functional, to the quadratic functional that the irregular linear problem uh, 
you would solve in the least squared sense uh, an additional term, which is called Tikhonov matrix that multiply the unknowns, okay? And will make such that once that this minimization of this is of this functional is now a well-posed problem, okay? Now, if the problem is linear, of course, you have a closed form solution of the least square problem, which with the, with, with the uh, insertion of this Tikhonov regularization matrix will be this one, okay? So as you can see, with respect to the general solution of the least square that will give the products of this matrix here applied to the measurements, but this needs to be inverted, you have this additional term, okay? The additional term is the term that makes such that this product here, this matrix here, that in, in, in a nil post problem, it cannot be inverted. We can be now inverted with the addition of these terms. Taking more simply is like adding diagonal terms in a more simplest form to a matrix that will be, that will have a to a low condition number to be inverted. Of course, uh, we want to use this type of regularization in a data simulation Bayesian framework. So the problem is posed a little differently, okay? Now you want to still solve the problem of estimating the parameter zeta given observation, but starting from a prior estimate theta zero. And also with the ability of characterizing the covariance of the unknown theta and the covariance of the data Z, the errors of both, okay? These, of course, are all terms that need to be somehow prescribed in solving this problem. Now, the quadratic functional to be solved is formulated a little differently, okay? Now you want to minimize, of course, in the least square sense, the misfit between the prediction and the measurement, but the Tikhon of term now is the term that has the quadratic estimation of the difference between the posterior estimate and the prior estimate that you also want to keep minimal. And of course, you have being the model linear, you get a closed form solution for this as well to give you a sort of update term with respect to the prior estimate. Written in this form is more clear. Okay. Now, this type of regular regularization can be also used in nonlinear systems. Okay, I will skip this part here for brevity, okay? In nonlinear ill post problem, now the, the problem is that the model is not linear, okay? So you can write it in generic form like this. And again, you want to estimate the parameter theta to minimize the misfit between the model prediction and the measurement in Z, okay? Now, the problem is that you can write in a concise form the functional to be minimized. Again, the misfit between model prediction and measurements and the Tikhonov part, that is the minimization of the distance between the estimate and the prior estimates. Huh? But you cannot have a closed form solution so, to this minimization problem. So, the, so the, we are, this is where what we call variational approach comes from uh, finding the minimum of a function through a variational approach, studying the variations uh, of this function here to be minimized. Okay, these are the result of the application of this uh, variational with Tikhon of regularization in the problem I mentioned. Okay, here are the initial parameters, uh, I'm sorry, the output of the model prediction in terms of modeled hydraulic uh, head level of water in the groundwater system with respect to the measured in the wells, okay? Pretty good even in the open loop solution, uh, much more dispersed in the open loop solution is the amount of um, surface movement induced by the groundwater dynamic with respect to the one measured by the satellite. Okay, once the satellite measurement are, are simulated into the system, 
you get not only a better estimate of the groundwater level, but also of the movements. And in doing this, you infer, you invert for some of the unknown aquifer properties. Like here, for example, the storage coefficients that control the elastic response of the system. And you can see uh, it's quite a varied in space field that varies by order of magnitude that could have been hardly inferred only from interpolating point measurements. Okay. So this is the final comparison on how the improved estimate explain the measured ground displacement spatial pattern that is quite a good coherence uh, for from the displacement, the subsident uh, predicted by the groundwater model and the one that is measured by the satellite. Okay. I will not go into the detail on how the, what is the statistics on how you measure uh, the spatial coherence uh, of a predicted field with respect to the measurement that you have. But also we obtain a quite a good coherence or agreement also in the time behavior of the displacement, both in the first years measured with the Envisat satellite, in red dots are the measured by the satellites, in blue, the displacement at different key points uh, in blue, the one predicted by the model, and here in the other period with the other satellite. So at the end, okay, still refers, fair, referring on the concept of finding the guilt of a crime, you know that especially in the US judicial system, there is a concept of means, motive, and opportunity uh, that are used to convince a jury uh, of a guilt in a criminal proceeding. Here we may say that the motive uh, relies in the aquifer deformation physics. Okay, there is a motive uh, upon which a, an aquifer may induce land deformation. The opportunity uh, stands in the fact that the spatial and temporal coherence of subsidence and groundwater dynamic, they have a similar temporal and spatial behavior and the means which is the true result of this assimilation is the actual capability also in, in quantitative terms of the aquifer system to induce that amount of deformation. So we may conclude that the aquifer and the abstraction of water from aquifer was the guilt huh, for the land sub substance. Okay, let me go in the remaining uh, time to the more complex uh, problem, as I mentioned, uh, many uh, hydrologic applications are characterized by both insufficient data, insufficient observation, and uncertain model parameters. So many hydrologic uh, problems and data simulation hydrologic problem need to address Geophysical inversion issues, that is parameter estimation or initial state estimation, we call also an initial state est estimation as a geophysical inversion problem, and Bayesian or state estimation problems, okay, together. Okay, now to solve together uh, state estimation and geophysical inversion, mm, you may essentially follow two main type of approaches. In uh, the dynamic filter is filtering, the Kalman type of filtering, linear or nonlinear, uh, you may use what is called filter augmentation, okay? It's like assuming that the parameters are states, dynamical states as well. Mm -hmm. If you want the parameter estimated like this, you eventually write an evolution equation for that parameter that tells that evolution is uh, null. That is the, the parameter needs to remain at the same value. But then you keep updating its values in a Kalman filtering sense. Or the other approach uh, is the variational assimilation with an adjoint, okay? What is the advantage of using an adjoint? We'll see in a while, okay? I will properly have time 
uh, not to show both example, but at least I will try uh, to show the first one, okay? Where satellite uh, 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 measurements are used uh, for mapping surface soil moisture control and energy balance uh, for soil atmosphere interaction. That is a problem that needs to estimate essentially how much uh, some information on the soil moisture and how the soil moisture control the flux in terms of heat and vapor from the air surface toward the atmosphere. And here, of course, there is a problem of state estimation, soil, of parameter estimation regarding the vegetation, regarding the type of uh, uh, turbulent flux you may have, and so forth. So the typical combined inversion state estimation problem. Okay. Starting from the first one, uh, a number of studies, uh, including this one I participated to over many years, is using the land surface temperature that can be detected from different type of satellites. Uh, I showed you before uh, in the first part of the lecture, the problem of filtering, of improving this type of information using, again, this type of measurement uh, thermal infrared of the land surface to infer to information on soil moisture and how this mo soil moisture controls the surface turbulent fluxes. What is the guiding principle? First of all, that you expect, and here you have a thermal image of an irrigated crops, uh, that because the presence of water, uh, wet surface will be much colder than warm surface for similar atmospheric and radiation conditions. Why is this? Okay. The reason for this is contained in what is called the surface energy balance. Uh, the energy that comes from the sun at the red surface may be uh, in part absorbed by the ground media right, in terms of ground heat flux and in parts dissipated back toward the atmosphere uh, with two main fluxes. Uh, what we call the latent heat flux, the flux of vapor and the sensible heat flux, okay? Now, for a given amount of energy, uh, the partition between these two flux will depend on the soil moisture. If the soil moisture is, 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 is high, you will have a lot of dissipation in terms of latent heat flux and little dissipation in terms of sensible heat flux. If the soil is, is dry, you cannot dissipate through latent heat flux. The sensible heat flux needs to increase to maintain energy balance and to increase the sensible heat flux the ground surface needs to heat up, okay? So this can be detected taking a, or measuring the diurnal cycle of the land surface temperature. The higher is the amplitude and the higher is the daytime temperature, the more likely is the soil to be dry. Of course, you, everyone, you, you experience walking in summer on the beach on the dry sand or walking on the wet sand near the shore, okay? There's a huge difference in temperature, on the sand temperature from the- uh, Fabio, I am very sorry. Could you please explain what mean the latent heat flux and sensible La flux? What okay. is the difference, yes? Okay, latent heat flux is the, I would say, is the heat content of evaporation, okay? It's essentially the process of evaporation from the surface and the vegetation that in terms of energetic content is just the amount of water which is evaporated multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization, okay? Is essentially the reason why we start sweating when we are in too much warm conditions to dissipate heat from our body, okay? Yes. Is the amount of heat which is dissipated through evaporation. Sensible heat flux is the uh, convection of, of, of heat 
by simply temperature differences. Okay. It may be both, molecular. Both, both processes uh, is diffusion processes. Both. Well, they are diffusion processes, but they are dif the turbulent diffusion processes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There is a lot of turbulence here, which is also one of the parameters that are uncertain that need to be estimated to have a correct representation of this process. Okay. But the basic principle is that the diurnal cycle of lens surface temperature bears in information of whether you are in this condition or in this condition. Okay. Now, I understand that the time is running very fast. Okay. Uh, let me ask uh, Alik or other all the attendants if I should spend time on explaining what is a multi or what is a variational appro approach for data simulation within a joint. Uh, well, uh, I try to explain, but it's, I think it's a better better if you will explain this particular case and this particular case just to understand the flow. Okay. Of, uh, okay. Let, let, let me go quickly. Okay. Yes. Again, yes, here you have a nonlinear prediction model with some uncertain parameter and states and an observation. Okay. Again, we split. What are the unknowns that can be observed, X, and the unknown can, that cannot be observed? That may be states or parameters, okay? Now, again, we want to minimize uh, a cost function that first of all, as in the Tikhon of regularization, has both the misfit between the, um, the model prediction and the measurements, okay? and also the update on the priors of the model parameters. But you also want to bring in, with respect to the simple case I showed you before with the linear article of regularization, the fact that you know this dynamics of the model, okay? And you bring, the, bring in this information to the, to, through the Lagrange multipliers, okay? So you have the Lagrange multiplier, the multiply, the misfit between the dynamics uh, and the model, okay? With the estimated parameters, okay? So you have a functional that brings in both, both the observation and the model prediction. And you want to minimize this functional. Of course, it's a nonlinear problem, so you need to use a variational approach. A variational approach means finding the derivative of all of this functional with respect to all the unknowns, the states, the, para, the unknown parameters, and the Lagrange multipliers, okay? Now, we taking some algebra that I will not do here, at the end, to estimate not numerically this, uh, these variations, but precisely, you may end up with this system of equations where you have, of course, your forward prediction model. You have a backward adjoint model. It's called the adjoint model because it has a similar structure with respect to the forward prediction model, but the unknowns are the Lagrange multiplier, and it is a linearization of the nonlinear prediction model. It has the minus signs, so it needs to be integrated back in, back in time, okay? Now, the parameter of date is proportional to the Lagrange multiplier. So you usually solve this problem by iterating through this equation until lambda vanishes. Why lambda vanishes? Because the forcing term of the adjoint model is the misfit between the model prediction and the measurements, okay? So if the model is predicting exactly this forcing of the backward adjoint model will be zero, and this will have a null solution. Lambda equal to zero, it means that you, you don't need to update anymore the states that you want to estimate. So usually iterate among this equation to converge toward 
a final estimate of the parameters that you need to estimate or the state that you need to estimate. Okay, you can apply this very general concept to any complex model, provided that you have the capability to code in terms of actual writing a model coding of this equation here, okay? You need to explicitly code this variation, for example, or this variation here, if you wanted to have an efficient solution system. Okay, in this case, we have a forward model that was based on the heat diffusion into the soil, okay? With boundary condition provided by surface energy balance I discussed before, with distinction between the bare soil and the vegetation. There is a lot of control of the vegetation characteristic in this flux. We know well that a forest will evaporate uh, much more than a grass, okay? So you need to predict somehow what kind of vegetation are you dealing with. So there is also a vegetation dynamics model and the retrieved daily states parameters are parameters that controls, as I said, related to soil moisture between the latent heat and the total flux, that is the distinction, the partitioning between the latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux from the vegetation and from the bare soil and the evolution of the, of the capability of the vegetation to evaporate, okay? This parameter here is called fraction of photosynthetically active radiation, which is the amount uh, of photosynthetic of uh, um, the amount of energy that is used by the plants for the photosynthetic for, for this photosynthesis. Uh. Okay. Why are showing uh, uh, this this uh, slide here? Not to go into the details, but just to show that in that very general formulation, you may plug. Uh, quite complex prediction equation, many parameters to estimate of different kinds, uh, different type of observation and so forth. So just showing some results to give you a hint of what are this kind of application. This is the site south of Mali uh, to the border with Burkina, it's called the Gurma site, which is a field facility that has been run for several years to also to provide ground measurement to a very important satellite mission, okay? And to have a feedback of the capability of the mission to measure uh, hydrologic variables in a very sensitive regions, the Sub-Saharan Africa and near to the desert to monitor also the apparent increasing extent of the desertic areas, okay? These are the type of results you get from this kind of assimilation. These are different times, uh, different period of times of about 30 days each, okay? Of the growing of the vegetation, which is the de detected through this method. And here, coherent to the growing of vegetation, the amount of evaporation, okay? So you have the capability of detecting more temporal trends and spatial gradient from the northern more desertic part to the southern more greeny part, okay? This is how, for example, these retrievals of the partitioning that we know to be related uh, to the amount of soil moisture uh, compared to actual soil moisture measurement taken in different days from an independent satellite measurement that directly measure uh, soil moisture that we use for verification. That is not a perfect match, of course, but you can, clear, can clearly recognize some distinct spatial patterns of the fields. And of course, there is also some ground verification with, I, as I mentioned, this was a, a site for a quite extensive field campaign with quite precise measurement uh, also from the ground of these fluxes at two, for example, two sites. And here is how this retrieval capability is, uh, how this algorithm, algorithm is capable of retrieving not just 
the average values over a given period, but even the diurnal cycle of the various relevant fluxes. Okay. Here, for example, is the comparison of the retrieved from this algorithm, the continuous line with respect to the measurement in this site here, where all the four terms of the energy balance were measured and, and how these are retrieved. Notice here, coherent with this changes here in uh, amount of uh, moisture and vegetation activity, okay, on how you have a sudden switch from a dry regime where most of the dissipated energy is in the form of sensible heat flux through this moist regime where most of the dissipated energy is in terms of latent heat flux, okay? Very coherently with what is measured at the ground. I have still have 10 minutes to go, right, Alik? So let me at least uh, give a hint of what would be an even more complex uh, variational assimilation approach, okay? For a very, I would say, hydrologic specific application, which is flood forecasting, okay? This type of flood forecasting um, uh, problems are solved by quite detailed hydrologic model that needs to resolve the formation of runoff and propagation of runoff along the river network at quite spatial, a quite very high spatial resolution. This, for example, is a model is used operationally to uh, provide real-time flood forecasting in a basin near Firenze. Actually, Firenze is here, okay? And the model is run at a resolution of 500 by 500 meters, pretty high resolution, with about 8,000 different reach, um, river reach lengths, which are modeled in this quite detailed model. We did the processes that are involved in the runoff formation, quite a bit com complex model. I did put the complexity of this model halfway between a model like the one I showed you before and an atmospheric model. Now, the problem is that we have very little information in case of flood events to use to improve the prediction. Huh? To improve the prediction of flood wave, you need actual flood wave measurements. As, as I mentioned in the introduction, river gouges are becoming more and more sparse in space. In this case, we have only five gauges that are operationally and routinely used with reliable river discharge information. We did some hint cut experiments, okay, to see how the flood prediction can be improved from, through data simulation technique. I'm showing you this picture yeah, that shows for 16 different high flow events, the recorded peak flow at the downstream gauge and the basin average cumulative precipitation. I always show uh, this picture in, for, for example, when there are also meteorologists present to see and uh, to convince them that predicting flood is not just predicting rainfall, okay? If you are predicting rainfall quite well, you are predicting the amount of, of rainfall, okay? But for similar, amount of rainfall, you may still have a huge variability in terms of runoff response and flood formation, okay? For this similar amount of rainfall, about 70 millimeters average on the basin, in a given event, it has been a peak flow of 500 cubic meter per second. In another, from a precipitation point of view, similar event, almost four times more. So you need a hydrologic model to resolve this type of variance. Again, here, there are some techniques I will skip, okay? The possibility of having predetermined flow paths that help in reducing the spatial problem into a multivariate one, -D, one dimensional problem. Again, a problem of localizations of the uh, ground measurements I mentioned before and so forth. Again, here we still have the problem of uh, estimating 
both states and parameters, okay? So we go again with the variational approach. The main parameter to estimate, which is actually not really a parameter, but is a state, but is treated as a something that is not observed. So from the, this technique point of view is like a parameter, is the amount of runoff that is coming from the hill slope into the channels. Okay. Now we also uh, uh, try to explore the possibility of estimating, having a better estimate, not only on the runoff on the channel network, but also of the hill slope runoff all over the basin. Okay. This is difficult to adjoin, huh? but at least uh, mass conservation and rainfall distribution need to be maintained. So what we also tried is sort of mixed variable, uh, variational and particle filter is a Monte Carlo type of filter approach. Uh, what we do is I will try to uh, synthesize in this scheme here. Uh, we use hydrometric data with the variational simulation within a joint uh, to get increment of analysis of river flows, okay? Then in perturbing soil moisture and rainfall interpolation parameters, we get an estimate of the produced runoff, okay? Then we can do a sort of likelihood match between the many ensemble members of the producer's runoff with the one that the variational simulation of hydrometric data will tell, which is the best estimate of the total runoff, okay? So in a sense, we have a variational approach that provide the likelihood for a Monte Carlo assimilation. So this will provide at the same time an improvement uh, in the estimate of the river runoff and the analysis of improvement of the state estimation in terms of hill, hill slope runoff and soil moisture. These are a few examples, okay? These are hint counter experiments as I mentioned on real flood events on how the prediction of the flood hydrograph for a given event, a different gauging station will depend on how early you assimilate, okay? Of course, here we are talking about prediction. So we want to improve the capability of predicting at least toward the outlet uh, to improve the prediction of the peak flow before that occurs, okay? So assimilating, reverse discharge before the arrival of the peak. And of course you have different performance and you expect to have better prediction as you start assimilating more and more as the flood wave develop. Here, I will not have time to go into the details. You have a sort of, you can find that in the study as I mentioned at the beginning, okay. You have the details on how, for example, the performance of the data simulation system in terms of improved root mean square error of prediction changes in terms of lead times, okay? Of course you expect uh, the longer is the lead time, the worse will be the performance and the less will be the benefit of the data simulation. But except for some peculiar events, you still, uh, we are still able to detect quite strong improvements, even for quite long lead times uh, in the prediction uh, capabilities of the system. Okay, this is an example of the sort of uh, analysis of the hill slope runoff that you can get uh, by with that mixed technique I mentioned Again, still assimilating only river observation in this point. That is, so this type of quite advanced variational and Monte Carlo assimilation together, we can use this point observation to improve the estimation of a quite distributed field like the hill, hill, hill slope runoff production. Okay, I think I about, I'm, I'm about finished. I still have one minute. 
So as just as concluding remarks, uh, I will mention some trending, what I call trending topics, at least some of them that I see uh, out there uh, in conferences, in recent publications and so forth. On the three ingredients, okay, that make a data simulation system, the models, the data and the techniques. On the models, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the characteristics of many of the hydrologic community is to have in time gave birth to a plethora, to a jungle of many different problem specific models. And this is strong weaknesses. Huh? Now there is a strong effort in building what are called digital twins, okay? Also in the hydrologic community. So there is an open path still to be completed to board the holistic or application independent ideological model. It's a big effort that is ongoing that will involve a close cooperation between hydrologic and atmospheric science and other geophysical sciences community. There are big advancements also in the data that can be used for to be assimilated in hydrologic models, mainly, for example, user generated contents. Okay, the data that you can get uh, from a sensor uh, that you bring every day with you and can and that continuously uh, sense the environment, starting from your smartphone. Okay, they have temperature and pressure sensors. What are called opportunity data? A typical one, for example, is uh, uh, attenuation signals uh, from satellites. From, for radio transmissions. Uh, citizen science, involvement of citizens in collecting data, okay? With terms, with data, in terms of data technical techniques, as you know, the big novelty uh, is the joint use of physically based model and data simulation technique and artificial intelligence learning algorithm. I know that you will have a specific lecture on this, okay? I would just mention that most of the of this application I see out there in data simulation benefiting from learning algorithm is mostly in the sequential data simulation approach. Okay, where you have iterations. Okay, and e each iteration, the system would provide additional information on how the system itself react to each iteration. Okay. A learning algorithm can learn from how the system converge on how a covariance matrix evolve in a sequential Kanban filter to improve, for example, the convergence to reduce the computational efforts and so forth. Okay, I think I will finish here.